Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Studies in Jewish Education at Brandeis University. I'm John Levison. I'm director of the Mandel Center. I'm delighted to welcome you to this spotlight session on Machloket. We can translate Machloket as debate or disagreement, but we'll get back to that in a moment. Um, first, I want to mention, as I always do at our events, that the Mandel Center is committed to developing and promoting scholarship in Jewish education in order to make a deep and lasting difference on the lives of learners and the vibrancy of the Jewish community. This session and our other events are a way of serving our mission by getting ideas out into the world. I encourage you to visit the center's website for more information about our various events and a link is now uh, available for you. In our spotlight sessions, we tackle a topic within Jewish education or a topic that we think is highly relevant to Jewish education, and we do it with a diverse group of panelists. So we'll have an hour and a quarter to dive into our topic today, and we'll wrap up at 2.15 Eastern. We're conducting the session in a webinar format. So uh, the audience will only be able to see the participants, but you can submit questions to us through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Our session is gonna be recorded. It is being recorded and will be available afterwards uh, on our website and also on our podcast, uh, which is called Learning About Learning. Now, let me say a few words about the topic of Machloket and why we think it's worth talking about today. In contemporary Jewish education, we typically talk about machloket in two ways. The first way we talk about it is machloket within a text. So as everybody knows, our texts, the texts of the Jewish of the Jewish tradition, do not speak with one voice. We find contradictions between texts and authorities of different eras. We find contradictions between texts and authorities of the same era. We even find contradictions within particular texts. And in fact, it's not, a, it's not a stretch to say that this feature is one of the defining characteristics of the Talmud, which is the central text of rabbinic Judaism. And that's really quite remarkable that a text would be devoted to presenting disagreement or dispute rather than presenting a central unified message. And then there's a second way that we talk about machloket, which is disagreement or dispute between whoever happens to be reading a text or expressing an opinion. So we have machlokot within our texts, and then we have machlokot about our texts. And all of this generates a set of educational questions. Is machloket something to be promoted? And if so, why exactly? And if we do think that we ought to promote machloket, how do we do that? And how and in what ways do we do that? And these are enormously important educational questions, but there's also a reason to focus on Machloket that has to do with this particular historical moment, a time when it has become so hard for us to disagree with others without destroying the bonds that tie us together. The toxicity of our discourse has an effect on individuals, on families, on communities, and on whole societies. So it feels particularly pressing, particularly important to think clearly and creatively about the kinds of machloket that we want to promote and how we might be able to do that. We've brought together a great group of people to share their thoughts about machloket. Let's bring them onto the screen. Let me introduce them very, very briefly. Abby Dauber Stern is co author of For the Sake of Argument and now co directs the project by that name. Aaron Dorfman is the founder and executive director of A More per Perfect Union, the Jewish Partnership for Democracy. Robbie Gringas is the other co author of For the Sake of Argument and co directs that project with Abby. Ori Kent is co-director of Pedagogy of Partnership at Hadar, and Mike Urim is the Chief Lear Jewish Learning Officer for Jewish Federations of North America. Welcome, everyone. It's good to see you all. Yeah. Um, let me begin by, uh, by asking each of you 
um, the kind of foundational question, why is Machloket important? What are its advantages relative to whatever we might think of as the alternative to Machloket? And let me um, let me begin on my screen by calling on Aaron. How do you think about this question? Why is Machloket important? Thanks, John. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about this conversation and grateful to be here. Thanks to the Mandel Center and to you for the invitation and uh, excited to learn from my colleagues. Um, Aristotle has this great line that says uh, uh, a human being outside the community, outside the palace is either uh, uh, a god or a beast, um, but more likely a beast. Uh, and I think that that like, to me, that's the, that's the crux of this thing. The, um, the, the, the knowledge and the choices that we, the knowledge that we construct and the choices that we pursue as a society are pro are social products. They are, uh, arrived at through deliberation. They represent, um, communal, uh, choices and, and exercises, and they need to be constructed um, through dialogue and disputation and deliberation among human beings. Um, and human beings are distinct and different. So mm -hmm. having, a, having a framework, having a conceptual framework like Machloket um, allows us and provides us with the, the mechanism to bring our different experiences, expertise, perspectives to bear in, in dialogue with one another in order to construct the knowledge that we share and the policy choices we make. Um, it reminds me of the the, um, the 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 monks and the elephant, right? That each of us sees one part of whatever that elephant is, and in the absence of some um, mechanism, framework, set of guidelines and principles to deliberate about it, uh, we end up with a tree and a snake and a you know whatever the other things are that the, the monks see. Um, I'll, I'll I'll close by by just referencing the way John Stuart Mill talks about this, uh, which is that. Um, there are sort of three critical elements to the that that deliberative process and the value of diversity of perspective uh, that I think gets captured in Machloket. The the first is that uh, it's entirely possible that the other, um, even if that other is a, a minority of one, could be right. So like I need to be in dialogue with that other, even if I'm right. Um, I need to have the other uh, force me to um, articulate and enumerate the reasons behind my rightness. And the third, which is the most likely scenario, is that neither of us are fully right. And it's only through the deliberative process, through the dialogue that we engage in, that we arrive at you know, something approximating uh, the truth or the best, the best course forward. So I'll start there. Thanks, Aaron. So, um, the, so there are different aspects. But, um, but one of the kind of central points here is that there's there's something about uh, the partiality of of each of our experience. We understand something, but not completely. Um, and if we're planning to live together, if we're planning to be in community or to co create a, a society together, then we need to figure out how to how to engage um, across those differences. Um, Orit, how do you think about this question? Why is Machloket important? Thanks, John. Um, so I actually think uh, Aaron and I are pretty aligned, um, and but I will talk about it a little bit more um, in educational terms. Um, so I think it's a construct um, that holds both sides, as Aaron was talking about, and allows us to see the relationship between them. Um, and it allows us to create something that we call in um, our work interpretive space. Um, hearkening back to the interpretive tradition that we draw on in the pedagogy of partnership. And it's in this interpretive space, which is neither a space of, this is my opinion, like I like coffee ice cream and it's the best ice cream around. Um, like that's an opinion. We can all like whatever ice cream we want and it, we don't need to have evidence for that in any way. Um, so it's neither that, and it's also not, um, it's snowing outside. Like, there, I can see the snow through my window right now when I turn to the left. Um, and in between those two extremes is actually the space that is where the heart of human life lives. Um, too often we call it those other things, but it's really about holding this interpretive space um, and exploring and arguing and considering implications. Um, and in the ideal, being able to see something much more fully. Um, and we know when we study how people engage with each other and how people learn together, um, 
we're not really good at holding open this interpretive space. We rush to make judgments about things. We rush to say we understand something when we don't, or we rush to say we agree when we really don't. Um, and we need to really create that space so that we can all um, reach better decisions in the face of an ever increasingly complex world. Thanks. Uh, are we, you've you've already introduced for us one of the challenges um, in in the way and one of the obstacles in the way of um, of productive interpretive space. What you call interpretive space, but a productive engagement across difference, and that you've used the term we rush, right? We 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 move quickly, um, and I hope that we'll get a chance to circle back to that dynamic of what happens when we rush, what happens when we slow down and and how central that is to um, to your thinking about Mahlokan and maybe that of others. Um, Abby, turning to you, how do you how do you think about this question? Why is Mahlokan important? So if I were to give the most basic summary of what both Aaron and Orit said, and i'm I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of bring it down a level for a sec, <laughs> which is argument, Mahlokan makes you smarter, makes mm. all of us smarter. Mm. Um, and if I can uh, quote Ian Leslie or paraphrase Ian Leslie from his book, Conflicted, um, he very much points to, to several studies showing that um, that this true, making us smarter, making us better, um, is true in almost every realm of our lives. So whether it's businesses, right? A business that has a board that always agrees with one another and doesn't ever bring um, other opinions is doomed to fail because they won't see what their, what, what their um, obstacles might be. Um, they'll ignore them. Um, and 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 won't overcome it. And if they have differences and they don't share them, it'll at some point explode. Um, so it's good for business. It's even good for marriages, says Leslie. Um, if done right, if arguments are done well, um, we get to know each other better, right? Our spouses, you know, spouses get to know each other better. They share that things don't don't get harbored for a long time, um, and so that that gets better. That's not necessarily smarter, but it's definitely better. Um, and certainly, um, if critical thinking is used, which I think is an incredible part, you know, incredibly important part of of arguing, um, that also makes us smarter. Great. So uh, we might sometimes think about arguments as um, or the necessity for compromise in arguments. And Abby, you're pointing out that um, actually, this is not about my giving something up, but actually achieving something better, smarter. Uh, you know, more insightful, more long lasting. I, I get a lot of good stuff out of this. It's not just about having having to, you know, give up something that I care about. Um, Mike, over to you. Tell me how you tell us how you think about why Mahlok is important. I totally disagree with everything that's not. Yeah, of course. Uh, I think there's <laughs> a lot of alignment, but I want to I want to try to approach it from a, a different standpoint. Uh, for the past two years or so, um, I was teaching something called Machlok It Matters, which was a curriculum developed by Pardes. Um, and we were teaching it uh, increasingly in a way that responded to people's pain. And I think when you ask like, why is Machlok It important? I think it is an antidote to a huge amount of pain that people are feeling right now about the breakdown in public discourse. And I think it plays out in people's hearts that they're like looking at their phones or reading the news and are in a state of outrage about what people are saying and doing and how can this be our world. Um, it plays out in families where people of different political persuasions or different generational um, levels, there's a huge amount of tension that can tear families apart and destroy family events. It plays out in Jewish communities and obviously in our larger society. And I actually think that Machloket is the key um, to solving some of this breakdown. Um, Part of it is there, we're not actually fighting with each other. I mean, we're fighting, right? There is discord in our society and in our families, but there isn't discourse. And so there's a real difference between citing your sound bites or reciting your slogans or creating false binaries where you're either with us or against us. It's black and white in every one of these situations. Um, and this is like a profoundly Jewish idea. Um, we sometimes say in Machlok It Matters that there may not be Jewish agreement on any central Jewish theme other than complexity is better than simplicity, that you have to engage in some kind of dialectical uh, tension in order to yield wisdom. Um, 
And this is a great countercultural thing that we can reclaim. And what it can do is it can really, everyone in the middle, and, and Jonathan Haidt's recent research says it's about 80, uh, 3, 87% of Americans are, are not in the extremes. And most of the time, people in the middle are left saying, well, those people are crazy and those people are crazy. That's a very weak position. Uh, and it's a valueless position to just point out how everyone else is wrong. But to actually say that we value a certain kind of debate and the complexity is better than simplicity, this is a muscular middle position that can create space for a more pragmatic conversation for everyone who's not interested in just the slogans of the binary sides. Thanks, Mike. I, I, I particularly appreciate your uh, kind of keeping front and center the the pain that people feel, the difficulty that people have in navigating their lives, their relationships, um, their commitments, uh, you know, trying to do good in the world and um, and really having having trouble given where we are. Um, you mentioned the United States, and obviously it's it's not only limited to the United States. Um, Robbie, tell us how you think about this. Why is Mahlok important? Thanks, John. Um, actually, listening to everybody, I felt like just writing in the chat what they said and, and <laughs> figured that that would cover it. Um, so I suppose I, I'm going to add on one additional piece uh, that I've been noticing as we've been doing this work on uh, arguments um, over the last month or so, um, is that what I find is that argument also leads to intimacy. Um, and that there's something going on that there's a loneliness in a relationship which is built only on what we have in common and doesn't allow room for where we're different. Um, and that obviously done in a in a healthy way, or even just done with an intention to get to know each other a little bit better, um, leads us to a place where we can be comfortable with somebody because not only do they see how I'm like them, but also they see that I'm I'm different. Yeah, that's really powerful, um, Robbie. I'm thinking about, you know, how I, I want somebody to take me seriously enough to disagree with me. I, I, I don't want to be ignored. I don't want to be patted on the head. Right. I want if you, if you disagree, like you, tell me, let's talk about this. I, I want to be uh, I want to be in it. Um, and I as think Jane know, Austen has that Jane Austen has that line should that where she um, she didn't want to pay him the compliment of disagreeing with him. Right, right. So we would like to help people pay each other the compliments of, of disagreeing. Nice. Um, wonderful. Thank you for, for launching us in such in such a powerful way. Um, I want to turn to our next topic. And, and here I'm not going to call on, on uh, individuals. I'll just invite us to, to have the conversation. I want to think about what we might call good versus bad Machloket. And what I mean is, the question I want to ask is, when you think about whatever the right kinds of Machloket are versus whatever the wrong kinds, what do you associate, what are the qualities of the the good kind, the right kind, as opposed to um, the other kind? So, Go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll dive in. I, I, I just thank you everyone for the comments. It was like, I took copious notes as, as everyone was sharing their, their Torah. Um, so there's two ideas I want to offer about the, the right way to do it. So one um, comes from a Midrash on the book of Psalms, where it says that every issue uh, can be understood with 49 reasons why it's one way and 49 reasons why it's the other way. But the text of the Midrash actually uses an interesting word. There's, there's at least two Hebrew or Aramaic words for logical reason or legal reasoning. But the word the Midrash chooses is faces, that there are 49 faces. And I think part of how we enter into a debate, and again, it's really countercultural to the, to the binaries of today's contemporary mm -hmm. discourse, which is rather than simply saying, like, I'm righteous and you're wicked, um, I'm not even going to look at one of the 49 faces inside of you. And, and I may not understand the 49 faces inside of me. So I think there's a, to, to confront that even people that you fiercely disagree with, even people who might be dangerously wrong, that there is a human story behind what led someone to hold the position they're holding. 
and that it is good for you as a human and it's good for the society. And it's good even if you just want to win just from a perspective of, of effective advocacy that you have to be able to, to go beyond the simple caricature of the other and to see those 49 faces. Um, and then in Mahlouk, it matters. They, they're these beautiful, sort of everyone knows like Hillel and Shammai debate. So, you know, there's a famous mission in Pirkei Avot that says that what Hillel and Shammai did was right and what Korach did what was, it, what was wrong. It doesn't really explain it, but there's a medieval Jewish commentator, the Meiri, and, and I really love this. And I think, Abby, it relates to what you said about even in marriage and Ravi to what you said about it creates intimacy. What the Meiri says is that good fighting, um, which is what Hillel and Shammai did, is when you're fighting to understand each other and to understand the truth. That you, you fight to get closer and to see each other's humanity. And that's contrasted by Korach, where you're fighting out of anger or simply a desire to defeat. And again, we may need to defeat evil in the world, but when it comes to discourse and to maintaining a family or a relationship or a society, you can't, you can't defeat the other, right? It, that is a huge, creates a terror in the relationship. So there has to be a way to debate until you understand something that allows you to move forward. Nice. I, I love that. Can I jump in? Go ahead. Um, I, I love that because it actually, it speaks, um, the, te the text really speaks to, to the sort of framework that Rabbi and I offer and often offer in some of the workshops we lead for the sake of argument, where we, we talk about three types of argument that have three very different goals. And so one is debate, where the goal is to convince somebody else, right, to win or to convince. The second is negotiation, where the goal is to agree. Um, and the third is what we call healthy argument, but I think is really what, what we're all talking about here, which is to, to learn, to communicate, to, right, to, to grow, um, to get to know one another. Um, and that really seems to, to speak to, to the kind of um, the same idea, right, that, that you brought from, from the Meiri. Um, and that's so for us, that they're not, it's not to say that, that the debate and negotiation are bad. They each have the place, right, and, and a role and a time. Um, but very when, when we're talking about the sort of dinner table conversations, um, or we're talking about classroom conversations, um, educational conversations, those most often, um, the, the, what I would say is a good one is the healthy argument, the, the, the model of gro growth and learning. Oh, wait, are you going to jump in? Yeah, I wanted to jump in um, and push a little bit on this idea of debate because it's so prevalent in schools. Um, but I want to step back and just frame it um, with something from the Nativot Shalom, um, a 20th century Hasidic rabbi um, who talks about a machlok at l'shem shamayim, an argument for the sake of heaven, that this is um, when we engage an argument and we don't move from the spot where we're arguing until we've reconciled and have figured out some way to work together. Um, so there's a lot of ways to interpret what that means, but one of the ways is to take away this understanding that um, we're, we need to understand that we're all on the same team on some basic level, um, which can be a very hard concept to grasp. Um, in some ways, I think young children understand it better than most everybody else. Um, so this idea that we're all on the same team um, as humans um, is a really deep idea. Um, and I think debate at least the way that it sometimes transpires in educational contexts um, can really unintentionally sort of undermine that um, and create a context where arguing is all about squashing people. It's all about, and even more than the squashing people, which it's like, it's about points. And there is something very, points like have staying power and this idea of we need points. And am I getting my points in my debate? And how do we get our points in life? Like that is just a concept that has staying power and that we unintentionally enforce and reinforce okay. over and over again. Um, and one of the things that we work on when we work on um, these different practices of engaging in conversation and argument, they're listening, articulating, wondering, focusing and supporting and challenging um, with learners of all ages is to engage in um, challenging as a team. So not just debating someone else's idea, but actually working together to challenge an idea together. 
And then equally as important is working together to figure out how to support an idea together. Um, because we find that people are often as bad at finding constructive support for other people's ideas and as they are at mm -hmm. challenging them. Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll, am I off? Yeah, yeah I'll, uh, I'll, I'll jump in with that. Uh, um, I like, all of this is resonating very powerfully with me. Um, uh, I was I was rereading recently Jonathan Rauch's book, The Constitution of Knowledge, um, and uh, part of part of his sort of central principle in um, in the book is that there are um, rules that govern um, the the creation of what he what he calls knowledge, which he has a very precise definition of, and 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 I, I, he's not talking about machloket per se, but I think his the the observations that he makes bear on this conversation in a nice way. The two rules that he puts forth are are the fallibilist rule, which is that no one gets final say, right? The mm -hmm. the, the assertion that a person makes has to be debunkable, and mm -hmm. has to sort of withstand repeated attempts to debunk it which I think about as like, oh, right, there's no permanent answer. So I'm sort of accountable to future critics. Mm -hmm. And the second principle is the empirical rule, which is no one has personal authority to assert that something is true because of an identity that only they have, right? The thing has to be, uh, the capacity to make that assertion has to be equally available to anyone, which feels like a kind of a horizontal That's accountability. It's pretty countercultural these days. Super, super countercultural. Mm -hmm. um, and what I think is like woven into both of these things is the like the the build I'll offer on um on, on what my colleagues, my co-panelists have said, which is like good machloket uh comes from a place of humility, right? Humility about uh my own uh, authority in in the context of my my particular interlocutor right now. And a deep sense of humility about the fact that wherever we arrive, uh, some future critic critique may undermine that thing in a way that's meaningful and enhancing and uh, and improving. Yeah, I really appreciate the the um, the kind of the chronological openness, which um, you know it means that uh, Obi, you were talking about points, right? This is not about um, who wins uh, a particular debate. It's not about who wins a particular election. This is as open as, right, the, the, the future gets a say, as it were, in, in how this turns out, which if we're able to kind of keep that in mind, I mean, we still have to make policies, we have to make decisions, we have mm -hmm. to move forward, we have to do the best we can, but it does, hopefully it can, let's say it can, provide some of that um some of that humility bobby did you want to jump in yeah i i, I suppose i wanted to slightly play devil's avocado here mm -hmm. um and just to sort of uh um i i i suppose what 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 what's mm -hmm. um what i want to leave room for is process um because the definition of korach being the bad kind of arguer because he's coming with anger, with a desire to defeat and so on. Um, it's very human, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. And, 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 and I, sometimes I, I fear um, the ways in which nowadays we try and um, judge that passion before it's had time to work its way through. Mm. And so it gets outlawed before we can begin which on the one hand leaves, I think it's a shame to leave passion out if we can find mm -hmm. a safe way to hold it. Um, there's a journey that can be taken um, without us immediately judging Korach and getting the world to, you know, the earth to swallow him up. Um, because I think that the opposite way around, what sometimes happens is that these days, sometimes the desire to avoid the, the, the fire of passion is that we end up with a space which is, not just safe, but sterile. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it's something about a process. I think it's something about there's, we need to leave people time to all, yeah, that would be. So, Robbie, thing. I just want to just un make sure I'm understanding what you're saying. Are you, are you expressing a concern that if we, you know, set up some rules by which Korach is ruled out, 
let's say the anger um, or, or or some other quality, and we say, well, I can't have a productive debate with that person because they're not playing by the right rules, um, right? I set up I set up whatever boundaries, and maybe I do it for to protect myself. Maybe there's safety concerns um, that we we then short circuit the most important kinds of debate. Am I getting that right? Yeah, I I I, I think so. I, th I think that there's there's sometimes this danger that we um that we uh combine or, or or miss the difference between hurt and harm mm. um and sometimes that which hurts us is important for us to notice and for it to be noticed but it may not harm us mm. if we can keep keep going in that conversation and sometimes it gets ruled out um and i think yeah which is why i have a problem with the idea of in that specific understanding of Korach I think so many of our learners come into a conversation from a particular place um and and I don't know it, 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 there's nothing wrong with saying don't be rude don't be aggressive and so on of course that's that's is very important and at the same time there needs to be some space to for for the anger or as Mike was talking the pain to find its expression and Robbie, I'm also hearing you say that maybe, you know, alongside humility, um, and maybe we'll circle back to this, there's another another individual quality that's necessary, which is something more like, I don't know, resilience um, mm -hmm. to say, I mean, the, particularly when you're mm -hmm. talking about hurt and harm, that, uh, you know, we, we, we all, obviously we have to recognize that people have whatever fragility they have and if we're if we're trying to help them get better get stronger get healthier everybody then we also need to be thinking about resilience yeah yeah we tend Mike. to say emotions are signals not stop signs mm. I, I also, I, it, and this is a fascinating conversation but I, I i think that you know part of the way that we can lead in our families and our communities with the ideas that are being shared is to reframe some of these things, right? Like Robbie did it when he talked about hurt versus harm. But I think that sometimes discomfort, there's an assumption that discomfort's bad as opposed to it's the it's intended, that there's a we're looking for productive discomfort that can build um, resilience. And I, I just want to build on, on one other piece, which is um, I love that Robbie challenged a, a binary reading of Korach bad and Hill Shall My Good. Uh, which is perfect because we should always be rejecting all those the first simplistic conclusion in favor of something more complicated. Um, the way that we teach it in Machlok It Matters is through Jonathan Haidt and his metaphor of the elephant and rider. And the simple version of this, right, is the elephant is the kind of animalistic part of us that can get very reactive, that can get angry, it can stampede, it can throw off the rider, which is the more polished version of ourselves. Um, and part of what I think it, it what's so powerful about that metaphor is it's not it, it helps us remember that this is not the anomaly that when people are overcome with hurt or fear or anger, a sense of being attacked or scarcity, that this is this is what happens and all of us have this elephant underneath us. He has a great line where he says, just remember that when the elephant throws the rider off, it has an eight ton or a six ton weight advantage over the rider. And so like the idea is like, you have to lean into it. You don't have to shame people for having those feelings, which are human, um, but you can facilitate through it and address it. And I think part of what's interesting is that, you know, another version of the elephant is a fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. And research shows that when your fight or flight response is engaged, your body surges with like stress hormones, like cortisol and adrenaline that literally make it hard to empathize and to listen. Yeah and to show up intentionally, right? You become highly reactive. Um, and we can't just judge that and say that's, that's bad behavior. That is in all of us. Um, and to get to the intimacy and trust that, that has been brought up, like I think we have to acknowledge that. <clears throat> oh, wait, go ahead. Um, I mean, I was just, I think this idea of how do we support um, people to express passion in ways that um, both provide them with the, uh, 
the ability to be true to what they need to express, and that also doesn't completely shut things down, um, is like an extremely important point here. Um, and at the same time, I think that there are just, again, so many, too many binaries around like, what does passion look like? Like there just are these assumptions around what does passion look like? And and in many, again, just going back to the school context that I work in, in many contexts, um, there's often this assumption that like the more that we're like gesticulating and raising our voices, like that is the sign of true passion and true <laughs> learning. And that's what we should all be going for. Um, so context really matters. Like what are the <laughs> cultural norms? What are the cultural assumptions that we have? And how do we sort of what needs to get balanced out in those contexts. In Israel, that's just a conversation. Right. It's just a conversation. <laughs> but but is it a conversation for everybody, right? Like, and who is left out of that conversation? And that's just one image of a conversation. Um, and the same thing with discomfort. Like, there are so many layers and levels. I mean, we, like, in education, we always talk about discomfort is at the heart of learning, right? That's what, how you grow. Like, we can point to, like, processes that happen in the brain, like, where it's literally uncomfortable what's going on as we extend ourselves. Um but like it's all in bad like there's only so much like so much discomfort and what's just uncomfortable to me may not be uncomfortable to you um and and so i think all of this is sort of pointing us in this direction of how do we kind of create contexts that um really are able to hold some of these things in balance um and where there's some guidance and facilitation that is sort of someone looking at the bigger picture to help keep that balance and attend to some of these things. And that doesn't mean that people aren't resilient um, or that we're not building resilience. Um, it just means that people are really different and are coming in with a whole set of different experiences and assumptions. So let me build on that and 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 sort of push Awid and, and others. Mm -hmm. So in, in your view, so what are the conditions for, for healthy machloka? Like what has to be in place for individuals, for a community to, to enable the right kinds of machloket. You want me to jump in or Aaron, I know, wanted to say something. I was Wait, gonna, you go ahead. Yeah, or you go. I was going to layer on another thing, but I can bring oh. it on. Bring it okay, inside. layer it and then I'll come back. Layer it, layer away. Well, I'll, I'll just offer up this, like, I think, I think um, I'll, I'll, I'll add an observation that I think is salient here. I think um, there's been, there's been a lot of really good um, and, and deep reflection about the individual, um, about the, 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 the pain response, the anxiety response, the discomfort response and how that happens individually. And I think that there's another component that I think we, like is, is hovering around the sides, which is the, um, the social belonging tribal quality to all of this, um, which feels very salient in this particular moment that that uh, the um, my, you know, uh, uh, belonging comes before being right. And my capacity to engage in machloket is is um, and, and engage in um, deliberative process is uh, and maybe this touches a bit on your question, John, uh, is shaped in a lot of ways by the my my ability to sort of be vulnerable, to feel like I'm not betraying my community by feeling like I'm not going to be left alone by saying the wrong thing or by betraying a set of norms or practices or beliefs that my community um, adheres to. And we're in a we're in a moment where um, a lot of that tribal belonging identity gets shaped through conflict with others, right? Like the the outgroup, and so I'm like my 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 own sense of comfort, well being, lack of discomfort, lack of pain is shaped not only by my what's going on inside me, but the 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 tribe that I'm a part of and the way that it defines itself against some other, you know, often tribes. <laughs> Um, so I think that that like that adds a, a layer of complexity that's that's really hard to navigate. Um, right. It makes and it makes it really really hard if you're if you're feeling that much more vulnerable. Um, it makes it that much harder to to uh, open yourself. Yeah, are we let's circle back to you? So I think um, I'm still processing a little bit of Aaron what you were saying <laughs> um, in terms of its relationship to then conditions for healthy machloket. Um, 
So I think there's certain things that we've already said, and then I'll just add on. I, I think, or at least I will, like the goal has to be larger than winning. Like we need to sort of have established that. Um, and we really in pedagogy partnership work around this notion of seeking understanding, that, which is not the same as seeking agreement. Mm -hmm. um, and that seeking understanding requires a whole lot of listening, um, which is something that we actually need to learn how to do. Um, and then sort of in order for that to kind of work there, we also need to have like a sense of um, respect or responsibility for at least seeking some truth um, and a sense of respect or concern for the other as a human. Um, again, that does not require us to agree, um, but there needs to be a sense that there is something that I might be able to learn. Um, and in many ways, it comes back to this um, Chavruta triangle that we work with, which is um, the cellular basis of relationships, where we've got people in relationship to each other and in relationship to some third thing. Um, and there always needs to be some third thing, and it needs to be a shared third thing. Like when we have a machloket, we need to be actually having a machloket about something, and we need to be having it about the same thing for it to be healthy. Um, and sort of the the hard work is how do we draw those lines that actually connect the points on that triangle. Does that mean that that we only have Mahloka with with people with whom we are in a relationship? I think when, so now you're sort of raising like, well, what does it mean to be in relationship? So in the moment that we, and this could get also in, so I, I think at, at the most basic level, when we engage honestly with somebody else's I, idea, we are putting ourselves in relationship to that person. Helpful. When there is an open, honest engagement of that sort. And it's again, coming back to, um, you know, we're paying respect to that person by acknowledging we have something to say to respond to here. Right. Other mm -hmm. thoughts about this question about conditions? Yeah, I'd love to, to jump in. So or we at least what you at one point I think we're saying was that you you focus a lot on on listening in particular. I mean also also some of the speaking, but it sounds like the listening is is something that that's particularly important. And say so we um, for the sake of argument, we've we sort of have it's rather than conditions, we talk about four intentions for kavanot that we like to set. And I'd say two are are focused on speaking. And two are more focused on listening. Yep. Um, one of the one of the challenges that we see is that um, in the culture today, a lot of times um, people actually are afraid to say what they feel and what mm -hmm. they think, like yep. that that fear. So we start with be brave, right? be courageous, um, say what's on your mind, say it kindly, <laughs> right? But but say it, don't hold it back. Be courageous. Um, and the second one in terms of the saying is sometimes. I say something and then I regret saying it. Um, and so we say to people in this setting, we're always allowed to ignore or forget the last thing mm -hmm. that I said. And so that nobody can say gotcha mm -hmm. to me when I've changed my mind, right? And I can't do that to the others, but it also frees me to really be thinking if we're in that learning space, that growth space, it's very much about, can I say something? Because when I say it out loud and I get people reflect back, I may change my mind, um, that, that act of, of speaking. And so those are the two sort of be brave and you can change your mind or the sort of two speaking related. And we really focus on those two, but we also believe that listening is important. Um, and we and so work they, on speaking too. No, I <laughs> There's nothing to do if you don't say it out loud to each other. Indeed, indeed, indeed. We, we've already actually kind of transitioned because um, I, I, that's this is one of the areas I wanted to lead us to and, and hear more about, which is, so how do we actually, if if now we've started to develop some ideas, I don't assume we all have agreements, but we certainly have some ideas about what uh, what a good machlok it is, what the conditions. So how do we actually um, help others uh, to do this? How do we promote the right kinds of machlok? How do we teach it if, if in fact we're able to teach it? So I'm curious uh, how you think about that, Mike. Yeah, I think um, it's a perfect segue from what Abby and Ari were talking about. And, you know, I think that probably each of us have 
our own constellation of like what the context is. But I think when we raise it up to the level that you just did, John, it this is a this is a leadership and culture issue, right? And and it could be a, you know about the two things that Abby talked about, or the things that are retaught, the triangle that are retalked about, or you know the five principles in in the core part of Machlok it matters. But in in the work that I've been doing, especially now in my JFNA role, is like teaching this to board chairs and CEOs and campus leaders and it there you we almost have to train people to be intentional about the culture that they want to build it's like we may have a lot to say about what's wrong with the culture we've inherited about how how quick we are to to label everything about the presumptions of achieving absolute truth or moral clarity on a given issue but but i actually think it's it's difficult but relatively simple to do this like that there has you have to have an approach which probably all of us on the call do but then i think what the leaders have to do is to to recognize that you don't have to play by the usual playbook now I'll just give two examples so in a hillel context i was the hillel director at penn for 15 and a half years we we're constantly confronted with political crises and my honest feeling as a Jewish educator was none of these were crises. The world thought they were crises. That, you know, there was going to be a BDS conference at Penn or something like that. But the reality is there was, there was a culture element and an education element. And, and one of the things that like, I'm so surprised that like, no one is giving per, per leaders permission to do is to say, the crisis says you're, you're either pro this or anti this. You have to choose and you got to come out with your statement. It's totally binary. And no one is giving leaders um, permission to say, well, there's a different way to navigate a crisis like this. I'm gonna hold the complexity a little bit longer until some other path emerges. But if you can state those values and, and put them into practice, um, all of a sudden people are, will glob onto that. They'll, they're desperate for it actually in a lot of ways. And I think the same thing happens with like um, in families and in board meetings, you get forced into thinking like are you, you have to pick a side it's one kid or the other it's one the in-laws or the biological parents right or in the board meeting it's like we're rushing to make a policy decision but this idea of holding up values about complexity about listening about seeing the humanity even to say to a board this is going to trigger you and these this is what it means to be triggered and this is how it plays out neurologically and here's the metaphor of elephant and rider and we want, we're not making a decision today. So everyone's elephant's going to get going. We're going to deal with that. And then we're going to get to a place where we can get the rider back on top. Um, sometimes just by stating it and giving people a little bit of a sense of confidence. And as Robbie said, process, to name that process. Um, we, we've seen this now anecdotally over and over again, that by naming what the culture is, the values are, and the expectations are, you can gen you may not change people's lives for the for the eternity of their of their lived experience, but you can generate more productive behavior for the next few hours. Mm -hmm. you, we, that's something that you can build on. <clears throat> like it's helpful that that so you're naming aspects of of a culture that um, may be unhelpful that may that sometimes leaders are in a position to um, to affect and that then can can produce. Um, a, a better quality of uh, of machloket. Other thoughts about how how we teach this practice? I th I think that there. Are, I, I I'm I'm left with uh, the work that we're doing. We're constantly trying to tackle the second question that always arises after we've done the workshop, which is in this lab process, in these perfect conditions, this worked really nicely what happens in the real world mm -hmm. um and and i uh, so, and i think that there are, i suppose there are two things what, what one is what what mike was talking about um of name or, or clarifying values um i think it's where we where folks in education can be of value i think the idea of looking for what are the essential questions when we think about the language uh, use of, of understanding by design to look for the essential question in the argument allows you to to raise up from the thick stuff into the thin ideas 
and then begin to have a, a conversation which is a value um we, we, we often even get folks practicing that just take a twitter spat and look for what are the essential what essential questions might you pull out from that and and the the, the other thing is i think that this pretty much it connects with all sorts of uh, com um uh, I, I suppose that uh, th this is going to move out of the jungle. So, so we're, we're getting off the elephant. And when we move out of the jungle, we need to be more gatherers than hunters. Mm. Um, and so that we sort of that we have uh, that that our target is curiosity and no other no other target. But that just that very idea of being a gatherer, not a hunter. I, I often wish I could say it to my brother. <laughs> so I, I, you, you mentioned um, Twitter. I want to actually um, lift up a question from a member of the audience um, who is asking about um, uh, online discourse. Um, and, you know, one way to think about it is just to say, look, that's the problem. And we need to find, you know, face to face encounters and build other spaces and make sure that that's one. I don't know, general approach. Another approach is to say, well, let's let's see if we can actually contribute to healthier a healthier cu culture of debate, even in electronic spaces. Um, I'm curious how how you think about that. Is it is it is it part of the problem? Is there is there potential for um, to to uh, to even bring healthy debate into the new ways of communicating that that dominate? Um, so much of our lives. So uh, I, um, I, and I think that Abby, do you want to go ahead and then I'll, did you want to? Either way, go, you go ahead. I'll, I'll follow you. <laughs> um, so I've just, um, wanted to back up and say, I think that, um, part of this is about developing new habits. Um, and while it's not rocket science, um, mm -hmm takes ongoing attention and that's what makes it hard um and it also so i think one of the things that like i'm most hopeful about some of the time is the work that um, we do with younger children and like really working from youngest ages of when language is developing developing different kinds of habits for how we interact with each other and speak to each other um, and imagining what happens when those young learners who have learned to say, can you tell me more about that? Or to constantly be thinking, is there another way of understanding this? Like what happens when they start to have access to online tools? And how does that get, how do we then change the way discourse occurs in that space? Um, so that's not to say though, that there aren't things that we can't do now. Um, and but it takes working with people on that medium, um, specifically, um, because it's hard to transfer from one medium to another. Uh, and I think we have found at least with students that, again, when we work on a particular medium with them on how to use certain routines and protocols, and um, speech tools, um, that it can happen online as well as it can happen in person, um, but it requires that work and the cueing um, and then the work of like reflecting so that it can become a habit. Wouldn't right. that be cool that if, if online people started using like TMM? We uh, need some. Tell, tell me more. And... Totally. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we, we need a whole new well, vocabulary and some new emojis too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. With more of this. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'll just I just add that, um, and I don't I you're you or you thankfully addressed some of, some of the the um, optimism and the the long term solutions. Um, I'm sort of just looking at like what what's going on that's different um, in the online space, and so a few things. One is it's disembodied. And if a lot of us earlier talked about relationships and intimacy and right and 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 all of that, it's that it's much harder online. And so it's e it's easier to say things you wouldn't normally say to, to somebody else if you were sitting in front of them and seeing them. Um, I'd say also we know that that social media um, is a lot about virtue signaling, right? Of saying I'm virtuous in this way or that way. I hold this political opinion or or or, or that political opinion. Um, 
in large part because it's, it's there forever, right? Once it's typed in, it's basically there, it can be captured and saved. And so um, there's another, just very different kind of use of, of communication. Um, and I'd say just sort of to add to that, right? If one of the things I said earlier was you're allowed to change your mind, it's mm -hmm. virtually impossible to change one's mind um, in that, right, in the social media format. And so it has many things going against it, you know, that, that speak exactly the opposite to what we're doing. So I'd say like, I'd start by, if we could figure out how to address those, and I don't know if we can, but I would say if, if we can figure out how to address those, those I think that's the three things I would I would address first in terms of social media. I'll, right. I'll just, yeah, I'll just, I mean, I, I just wanna like offer one nugget, which is I think that the framework, Abby, that you brought up earlier mm -hmm. about the distinction among right debate and uh negotiation and healthy argument right like that's that's a i think precision about what the purpose is to which we're putting a medium is really really important and uh it it i think there are a lot of reasons to uh, think about social media in particular as like not an optimal medium to do uh, healthy argument. So, okay, like we can probably do some things to tweak it, to make it less toxic, but, um, you know, uh, Ori, to use your, to, to use the, the pedagogy of partnership triangle, right. It's not a triangle. It's like two people and everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> like that's not the, that's not the model. Yeah. Yeah. That's not the model for Machloket. Machloket is, is like, serves a different purpose. Um, and, and probably, um, it definitely is uh, much more achievable in a different in a different medium. Yeah. And so is your goal, Aaron, to get people off of social media and into a room? Um, I mean, that's not my goal. It's my choice. I like I left social media <laughs> a long time ago, uh, um, you know, Bekavana with real, mm -hmm. real intentionality, because that's not uh, the, the, the purposes that it serves are not aligned with my well-being or my you know political agenda um uh but you know I, Aaron I'm very angry that you didn't like my post last week <laughs> and that's aged. exactly exactly can I, can I just um be I feel like someone needs to play this role in the conversation about social media which is like we're, we're being all very calm and analytical about it um and I can play that also, and I can be hopeful about it also. But I think it's it's not just all of the analysis that we offered. There's there's like it in uh, a kind of nefarious profit motive um, where this is not it's not just disembodied discourse. It's not just that everyone is at the dinner party mm -hmm. having a conversation. It's that um, they're the companies are building addictive. Again, I'm just like playing the luddite here, kind of right. But like, go for it. This it is designed to keep your eyeballs on it for the longest amount of time, and outrage and anger works better than anything else. There was just an article this past week, Shabbos in New York Times, about like seventy falsehoods uh, are propagated seventy five percent faster and farther than truths on Twitter um, because it makes it addictive. And if yeah. we go back to the elephant and rider. Uh, example, you know, there. I'm thinking of an article by Alexander Calais in Harvard Business Review, where he talks about the fact that those stress hormones, once the elephant is triggered, stay in your body for six to eight hours. While feel good hormones, if you have an amazing conversation with your partner on the way out of the door, um, it, that lasts for about 30 minutes. That the serotonin and endorphins or whatever it is, and and what this means is that we are. See, they should fix that. They should fix that. <laughs> <laughs> It just means that that if you are scrolling through your phone, you know, uh, over breakfast and getting angry, that you bring that into traffic and you bring that into your morning meeting, you bring that home with you. Um, and I think that if we can create enough in real life experiences that make people see like, oh, there's another form of existence that that will create the political will to hold the companies accountable to change some of these algorithms. But but we're really fighting with like both hands tied behind our back because this there's just there's such an amazing amount of money and science going into making this more addictive and more like this net you know this race to the bottom so to speak. Uh, oh, sorry. All right, go. No, I just wanted to clarify. 
I'm not super hopeful about social media. Um, <laughs> just in case I gave the wrong impression. Um, Too late. I've I... already tweeted it out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can you can change your mind, or you can change your mind. I, I can... <laughs> Uh, and I completely agree with what Mike was just expressing um, and have an ongoing debate with my teenager about it um, and do, though, actually try to listen to what he's saying, um, because there is a reality of a world that um, he's been brought up in that is not the same world that I was brought up in. Um, and and I think that's important to keep in mind, even as we try to get these algorithms changed and create a different paradigm for these platforms. Um, but I just wanted to also lift up the issue of speed, which we've touched on at various points, because that is another, in addition to the addictive quality or it's part and parcel of the addictive quality is the speed and you know the notification and the need to respond mm. immediately, um, which really gets in the way of our ability to attend um, and to process and to think. Um, and that is, you know, uh, you know, exponentially increased on social media, but it's also like a problem just in our face-to-face -face lives. Um, so that's why I want to raise it up, this issue of speed and how do we um, create a pause button when we're not on Zoom? Um, so, you know, in whatever medium that we're in, where do we build it, that in and how do we do it? Yeah, it feels like um, it, it. You know, we can't we can't do educational business as usual um, as the world changes, and the world always changes. And our responsibility as educators, specifically as Jewish educators, whether it's you know at a K twelve level or with uh, or with adults or with entire communities, has to really think carefully in, in the work that you all have are doing have been doing is is analytical it's diagnostic it's really trying to think through what is the nature of these of of these challenges in order to then um create educational not necessarily solutions but at least environments that that can um produce better healthier engagement yeah so go ahead mike no i was just also i think that the other when we're talking about addiction and slowing down i think I want to go back to something Aaron said earlier, which is it feels like the more confusing our world gets, the more seductive mm -hmm. notions of capital T truth are. And it's like it, the more intractable the problems, the more like it's almost like an, a, a seductive idol calling to us because it's something to hold on to, you know, with all the waves crashing over us. And, you know, part of, you know, or we talked about habits in all of these different features that folks on the panel have shared, this is starting to lay out a set of habits about how to how to consume media, what kind of media to consume. But if it plays off of only your passion, if it's if it's seductively marketing simple truth, if it wants it all to be quick, like part of what we can teach ourselves and young people is the habit of distrusting that kind of media. Um, and understand mm -hmm. that it might feel good, but it's it feels good in the same way that eating a cupcake for dinner feels good. It's brief. And then it leads to diabetic coma after, right? Or, or you know, sugar leads, crash. Leads to another one. Right. Yeah, or to another one. Right. Right. Uh, and I'll just I'll just piggyback on that and tie it to, to um uh something I mentioned before that it and and also related to something Orit said. It's not only the um the profit motive and the algorithms that are that are a challenge. Uh, uh, it's also and and not only the, the 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 capital T truth that we're looking for as a palliative. It is a kind of um, belonging that the um, the outrage machine triggers, and there are there are beyond the companies, the social media companies, there are nefarious actors who are using the vehicle. Uh, to to like to mess with us, right? Who are the, the the counter actors in this conversation? You know, I'm thinking like very specifically about Steve Bannon, who who like declared mm -hmm. like again, Bikavana, um, the goal of his his media machine was to flood the zone with shit, right? That's like his plan in order to make um, Machloket impossible, right? In order to 
like debilitate people's capacity to engage in deliberative discourse because the third object in the triangle or read is is not is like entirely disputed no it's not snowing outside right uh, um or or whatever and and that uh, i think that that presents a, a really significant obstacle that that we need to be we need to be working against so one of yeah one of the the um questions you know that I was thinking about and we didn't we don't really have have the opportunity but I want to I want to mention it as a question um in part because it also has come up in from from the audience has to do with um with boundaries and you know how do we think about the boundaries around uh around a, a community um within which we can engage in um in some kind of productive or healthy um machloket. But rather than diving directly into that question, as I said, I just wanted to lift up that question as a really, a really hard one. Um, keeping an eye on the clock, and I, I want to make sure that I get a chance uh, that we all get a chance to hear, um, to hear your final thoughts. Um, so this terrific conversation. I'm particularly really struck by the way that um, that uh, we've spent so much time thinking about. Um, about emotions, about human dispositions as sort of fundamental to um, to the ability to engage in Mahloket, which then suggests some of the educational mission of of cultivating those dispositions um, or or emotions. Um, but now, as we bring the conversation to a close, um, I want to just kind of pull back the lens and and invite each of you to to say maybe again, maybe with new emphasis, maybe something new about why Machloket is important to you and and why now in particular. Um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll go around. Mike, you want to lead us off? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, such a pleasure to be with you all today. I, I think that um, we know this. I think that we just, the reason Machloket is important is it can get us back in touch with the truth that we know, which is Every time we've been in a situation politically, organizationally, personally, where it seems black and white and simple, um, you can fight to your, you know, to the, to the sun goes down for your position, then you realize there's more going on under the surface. And, um, and so just to try to hold this value that complexity over simplicity, it's, it is a, it's a powerful Jewish value, and it's something that can disarm uh, the tribalism and the camps, and just to ask people, like, what else could it be besides what you, your initial impulse was? And just to get people to get, you know, as Robbie said, like, say more. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if we can just hold up, you know, you could be right, but like, it seems too simple. What else could be going on? Great. Arit. Um, so I think you know, more than ever, we need to be teaching people how to engage in healthy machloket at this time, um, because I think we've lost um, some core capacities for it, but also even more importantly, we've lost an imagination for it being possible. Um, and we don't know how to make arguments in ways that people can hear or to receive other people's critiques. Um, and we need to come back to teaching habits that enable this starting at the earliest ages and raising people up who have that experience, who can imagine a different way of being and bring that into the world, um, filled with curiosity, um, asking, tell me more, or can you tell, or is there another way to understand that? And not only asking, but acting on those ways of being. Thanks. Robbie. So on the one hand, Mike and Ori, you, I was reminded of um, that brilliant line by Theodore Zeldin, um, the fact that the world has become fuller than ever of complexity of every kind may suggest at first that it is harder to find a way out of our dilemmas. Mm. But in reality, the more complexities, the more crevices there are through which we can crawl. Mm. Um, but the other thing that I'm thinking about yeah. is kind of, I suppose it's not really to do with our work. Um, uh, I'm living in Israel right now. Right now, I've been here for nearly 30 years. Um, 
and I'm finding myself in a place where many people are shouting at me, at us in the world, um, that the time for conversation is not that it's over, but that it's irrelevant, mm. that it's, it is showing weakness in the face of a powerful enemy. Mm. And sometimes we have to stop talking. And I don't know what to do with that, but that's where I am right now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Aaron. Um, thank you to everybody and, and John again to you for this conversation. It's been fantastic. I, I think there, there are two things that are kind of percolating uh, for me um, in the context, particularly in the context of the work that uh, we're doing in a more perfect union around uh, trying to mobilize American Jews to protect democracy one sort of uh, defensive and one um, proactive. The defensive one is that um, I think I think we we Machloket is is a is a response to the fantasy that we have that the other people are somehow going to go away. <laughs> right? Like seventy four million Americans voted for Donald Trump in in two thousand twenty, and eighty one million Americans voted for for Joe Biden in twenty twenty. Um, there are a lot of American Jews who uh, who support um, uh, um, like a, a control of like like uh, I'm missing the word, but like annexing uh, the West Bank. And there are a lot of American Jews who now identify as anti-Zionists, right? Like we're those these people aren't going to they're not there's no there's no place we can put them. There's no way of like sequestering them away and uh like we need to get past that fantasy so i think that this is a this is like a, a critical piece of wisdom around that the other is that we have unbelievably hard problems confronting us as a as a as a as a as a civilization right um climate change war um uh, uh economic stability uh um the history of racism like we need everybody we need all those people, all, all the Jews, all the Americans, all the people uh, to bring their wisdom to the table so that we can solve those problems. We need to do it together. Um, so I think it's, I think it's the, the, those are the two things I'm sitting with. Thanks. I, I particularly, I appreciate the, the kind of the realism in the face of, um, of the fantasy that, uh, you know, that we can just, that can win this argument. You know, this, this tweet will surely surely turn the tide right? <laughs> now i'll get them yeah in 172 characters or whatever it is um this will this will make all the difference uh, no these are these are much much deeper issues abby yeah i mean i think um to sort of continue that line of thought Aaron, that um we each have what's sacred to us and we think it's the sacred and the only sacred and there's um, a wonderful text of Rabbi Nachman of Bratislav, Hasidic master, um, where he writes that argument, dispute, is an aspect of creation. Argument is an aspect of creation. Explains, right, the act of God creating the world. God had to contract God's self, Tim Stum, and then had to make divisions between, you know, between earth and sky between darkness and light, and those divisions that chiluk is machloket is is right the same root word is is the divisions, and he goes on to say that we, or chachamim the scholars, had to make room for each other. Right, they each had an opinion. If there was only one opinion in the world, only one opinion of the Beit Midrash, there wouldn't have been any creativity. They had to have arguments, and it's the very act of argument that allows us to continue the godly act of creation. And just as God was able to right, contract God's self, God is still sacred, even in that contracted form, but God left room for other sacredness as well. And so that's sort of how I think about this. Um, you know, what, what, what I'm hoping for is that we can see sacredness in each other, even when we disagree, and that we can make room for it. Wonderful. Thank you, Abby. Um, and thank, thank you to uh, all of you for, for your contributions. 
um, you know, that there, uh, I think there are some uh, interesting um, fault lines. We spent more time co-building ideas than we did um, an explicit, uh, an explicit disagreement, but it does remind me of um, how wonderful it is to bring uh, a bunch of people together and to talk about serious things um, in pursuit of, you know, in, in pursuit of a truth while recognizing that that truth is going to inevitably um, stay open for the future. Um, I want to mention that our next event is on uh, March 15th um, in a couple of weeks which will be a learning about learning session um, with Alana Horowitz. The title is What Girls Learn in Jewish Families. Um, if you uh, haven't yet signed up for our mailing list, um, please do so. If you haven't yet followed us on Facebook and LinkedIn, the Mandel Center is on social media still at this point. Um, please, uh, please do so. Um, thank you uh, all everyone for for coming for for participating, especially our panelists. Um, I, I delighted with the conversation. I wish we I, I hope that we'll have more opportunities. I wish we could go on for for a lot longer. Um, thank you all for joining us. Be well. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.